Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. Well, another week, another podcast, and we're back on the grind for you guys again. And I'm going to take a little pause from my European tour of uh, the podcast I took when I was up there in the Netherlands, and we're going to go ahead and kick a local one out. I had the opportunity to uh, interview someone that his car inspired me to build my car. And if you guys have listened to my story and you've heard that before, that is none other than Randy Gates. Now, Randy Gates built the famous 52 Azure Blue on gas burners, BRMs, and center lines. Had all three wheels, but it was featured with BRMs and mostly shown with the gas burners. But one of the top levels cars uh, painted and a lot of fab work done by Buddy Hale at Type 1 Restorations, a good buddy of mine. And this car was the car for me that when I saw it at the show, it had inspired me to pick a car, the Type 34 Gia, and paint it and have it built to that level. And knowing I couldn't do this myself, but I knew this car was so nice. I wanted a car that nice. And, um, you know, as some custom cars beget other custom cars and they inspire people and in this hobby that we have, we see somebody else's stuff and it inspires us to do something. This is the car that did it for me. So if you're not familiar with this car, you should be, but pretty much everybody is. Russell Ritchie now owns the car. It's in Scotland, part of the Russell Ritchie collection, Gasser Garage. And it's definitely a benchmark vehicle that when it came out, it really stood on its own. And it's a car that people reference a lot. And it was actually when I was having my car painted, that's what I said. It's got to be as nice as Randy Gates split window. So um, I'm looking forward to you guys enjoying this podcast uh, and checking it out. Again, we had a fantastic week at One Crazy Weekend. Within two weeks, I'll be announcing next year's dates so you guys can book the weekend because this year was a monster and next year is going to be all the same, but let's do some shout outs real quick. Jason with the 70 bus leaves us a five star review and he says, One crazy weekend is the title. We drove to Vegas for the weekend and was not disappointed. Had a lot of fun. I will definitely try to make it back next year. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, Jason, glad you came out. Super stoked that you had fun. And, and that's what it's all about. That weekend is about a good time. So don't worry about how polished up your car is or all that. Make sure she runs good. She got air in the tires because you got a lot of driving to do that weekend. And we'll be putting up another one first weekend. Pretty certain it's going to be the first weekend in October. Uh, that's the weekend we reserve with the hotel. We're just working out some details right now on it. And uh, it was an unbelievable time. So, so much fun that Jason gave us a five-star review. And that's why he's getting a shot on the podcast. You want a shot on the podcast, give us a five-star review. Go to Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review and you will get a shout out on the podcast. Pick up some merch from the store, which wintertime's coming, and we got brand new sweatshirts in the merch at the store on letstalkdubs.com. Click on the gear and pick something up. Support your favorite podcast. If you like what we do here, make sure you support it by picking up some swag from the store and show your support for your favorite podcast. So looking forward to that. Uh, don't know what shows I'll be at next. Um, probably doing something. I know I'm doing something coming up here soon. Went to Octo last weekend. It was a good time. Took my boy Andy Finch with me. He flew off out of town yesterday. So we had a crazy three weeks over here with him and uh, his lovely lady D. And we got to kick about over here for a few weeks, put a few thousand miles on a car, driving all over here, there and everywhere else. And uh, it's just been It's just been a crazy couple of weeks, so I didn't just have one crazy week, and I had one crazy couple of weeks with my buddy and from uh, from England. So looking forward to that. Some cool projects on the horizon. I want to give a shout out also to Impy for you there at the car show, and they, uh, you know, Joni was there, and my condolences to to Joni's family. Her dad just passed away, and her dad was Mister Bug, and also is the one that uh, kind of relaunched Impy again in the early seventies. So. Uh, our dad's name was Emil, and my condolences go out to her family, and Joni is one of a kind. So appreciate her and Impy. Um, and you know, Joni came out to the show. She's part. She's always here. She has a great time. And they uh, presented us with uh, a plaque that uh, they're going to be helping contribute on the Kia TC and get one of their 1914 long blocks. We're going to put that in there. George and I. We'll be doing a video that you'll be able to find on his channel. I'll have a different version of that video on my channel, and we're going to swap that motor out when I when I get it picked up from MP. Looking forward to that happening here in the next little bit. And that's going to go on my Gia TC. 
Now, somebody told me that they did not know I had a Gia TC. Well, that means you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel. So go subscribe to my YouTube channel today because some stuff I put on the YouTube channel, I was pretty sure I talked about on a podcast, but you never know. So anyway, without that, don't forget to support our sponsors. Obviously, if you need a long block, go check out Impy. Go support your local Impy dealer. Our local Impy dealer here is Nevada Off-Road Buggy. And I wanted to give a shout out to Maria at Nevada Off-Road Buggy for being super awesome. The whole crew over there being there for our poker run. Love those guys. If you're local here in Vegas, go support Nevada Off-Road Buggy. Support your local MP dealers and the people that support the hobby on the ground. Don't order it online. Drive down the street and get it picked up. So this is my plug for Nevada Off-Road Buggy. Marie and the crew over there, they're awesome. And they're your place to go for any VW parts here in Las Vegas. So, And also, don't forget to go subscribe today to VW Trends Magazine magazine for the people by the people back out on the scene after a long hiatus vw trends magazine go get you a copy today and you can subscribe at vwtrendsmagazine.com also ross wolf you want some cool aftermarket parts for your stuff you need a dash repair kit for your bus or you need stainless steel deck lid hinges how about a locking dipstick i don't know whatever you need they've got it ross wolf cool aftermarket parts made by enthusiasts for enthusiasts so go check them out today at rosswolf.com. Well, guys, it's that time. So Randy Gates, not just a pretty face in the crowd, not just the Azure Blue Split. It's 57 bus, 67 bug, tons of stuff to talk about here. So let's get into it this week, guys. The game changer, Randy Gates on Let's Talk Dubs. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. So on today's show, you guys may remember that, you know, I talk a lot about things that inspire people and cars that kind of light a fuse for somebody. And for, you know, back, back a while, we talked to Elliot Vansell and he said that my type 34 Gia caused him to spend a bunch of money building cars. Well, that happened to me. And that's the reason I built the type 34 Gia. And on today's show, I've got the, the owner of the car that, that lit my fire to try to build something that was a little bit detailed and over the top. And our guest today is Randy Gates, who owned the famous uh, split window. It was a uh, Azure Blue split window, I think it was. And it was 1952. And everybody, everybody remembers the split window because when it came out, it was detailed beyond comprehension. And it was just one of the cleanest split windows around. So on today's show, uh, I'd like to welcome Randy to the podcast. Randy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So... We're going to get into how the podcast when we starts, but I just wanted to let you know, we ran into each other at, uh, it was the downtown meet over there in, on Main Street, and I saw you probably a year or two ago. And a couple said, years ago. Yeah, yeah, and I grabbed you and I said, Randy, you're the one that inspired me to build some cars that I built based on the car that you built, and I'd love to get you on the podcast. We chatted back and forth, and, and I'm, I'm happy we finally were able to get to sit down and get you on the podcast, but you know, one of the things that, that I want to let you know is, when I first saw that car, it stopped me in my tracks. And what's so crazy is looking at the picture of the car today, the cars, it's a really unassuming car. You know, it's on the gas burners, it's, it's real sleek and it's slick, but the, the level of detail in that car was so intense. And one of the things that, that I made sure that we borrowed from the inspiration on your car was the, uh, the shift light and the line lock light that you had on the, on, the, on the steering column. I remember those so vividly and I was like, everything about that car was so clean and that car inspired me to build my Type 34 Carmen Ghia. And you know, it, it's just been one of these things that, that was so cool and I'm, I'm glad we got to get you on the podcast because I know you, you're more than just that car. You've got a, a history in VWs that's, that's spanned quite a few decades. And the way we always start the podcast is, how did you get into Volkswagens and what's your VW story? Right. Well, you know, uh, first I just wanted to say, and I do remember vividly running into you at the show in Fullerton. And, you know, I just want to say, I've been listening to a lot of your podcasts and there's a lot of great people out there. And what you're doing for the hobby is fantastic. And it's a, 
it's like you're bringing a passion back to it and it's really fun to listen to and hear the stories guys that came before me and have contributed much more than i ever have but um it's really cool that you're keeping the volkswagen dream alive no i, I you know I, I like I, I we talked a little bit off air and I, and I said you know my inspiration originally was that i listened to podcasts and i wanted something with vw content and then i started this one kind of on a whim and then just getting people's stories was really what connected me with this as to why I love the hobbies because everybody's from so many different backgrounds and their stories are so unique and yet there's always some overlap that we can connect with. And so for me, I've been really fortunate enough to, to interview a lot of people and some people that have passed away and uh, now it's kind of, now I feel like it's kind of my duty to keep it going. So, and, and your car is no different. You know, your car, when it came out, it kind of set a benchmark, you know, and there's, there's these, if you look at the hobby, there's these shifts when things happen. It just before yours was Aaron's car and then your car came out and it just started continuing this to where now we're at this detail level in the hobby now that's just insane. But yeah, it, as much as you're thanking me for what I do, I thank you for what you did because you know there's there's always a debate where people go back and forth like, oh, I built it, I sand it, I did this. And I'm like, yeah, but without the guys that commission the cars to be built, that that look at a time money equation and say, listen, my time is better spent doing what I do to make money so I can drive the car I want to. And you need, you know, like my Gia, I paid for most of the work done on that. And some people gave me a hard time about it. And I just said, I know my limitations and I know when someone's better at doing something than I am. And, and, and it's also without those people, the hobby would not continue to keep pushing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, your car was, your, was epic, you know, and I, and I, it's still owned by Russell Ritchie and he's a good friend of mine and he was just here recently and, and it's just, it's, it's cool. And, and, and. There's so much to it, but tell us your story. How did you get into VWs? Well, uh, yeah, I'm 67 and I grew up in Santa Ana. Mm -hmm. I think I moved there when I was like four. And I just really liked cars. And just as a little boy, you know, I developed a love for them. Um, my dad was a, out of the service, was an electrical engineer, but he was a mechanic before he went in. And so he worked as an engineer during the day. And then in the evening on the weekends, he had a distributorship where he installed something called Franz oil filters. I don't think they're around anymore, but back then he, he would, he would go to people's houses and, and work on people's cars and get these things installed. And I would go with him and just kind of watch him. And, uh, you know, he could just fix anything. And, and so he's somebody that I always looked up to, and um, and so I just became really interested in cars. I, you know, I had toys, you know, Matchbox and Hot Wheels and and stuff like that, and, and just play with them all the time. And I think it was about uh, I was probably eight or nine. I first really started becoming aware of Volkswagen, seeing those little black and white commercials. Yeah. In TV or in magazines, right? Like uh, Popular Mechanics or something, and. And um, so I really started thinking, wow, those are, those are kind of cool looking. And I was really just like drawn to them. And then when I was about 10, um, I used to ride my bicycle like five or six miles to the local VW dealer. I think it was called Commonwealth Volkswagen. I don't think it's there anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, go in there and, and just uh, uh, look at the cars and talk to the salesman and just like dream, hey, you know, I'm going to. I want to get one of these one of these days. It's kind of like starting my Volkswagen dreams. And then uh, through high school, a um, couple buddies had had some VW Beetles, 68, 69, and um, they just was like, I, you know, I just got to get one of these. And I started my first job, I think it was 72, 73. I was working at McDonald's on Bristol and saying for a buck 55 an hour. <laughs> And I was just like saving every dime I could, but it was like, you work like all week for 30 bucks. Right. <laughs> and uh, the store manager, he was a pretty cool dude. He had a light blue 67 Beetle and he would give me rides home from time to time when I worked the late shift. So I was like, wow, man, this is really cool. And it was around 73, 74. I got my first car, a 70 Beetle. And I remember the license plate. It was 462 BEY. Something that always sticks with you. Yeah. And um, my dad took me down to Renfrey Volkswagen, 
an orange and I think the car was like 1400 bucks and he paid half and I paid half and did all the paperwork and come outside and he wasn't much of a talker my dad and so he just said okay I'm gonna give you a quick lesson I was sitting in the driver's seat and he stuck his head in the window and he said uh, okay son there's three pedals there you got you got the clutch you got the gas and you got the brake and that shift pattern right there that H on the knob he goes that's how you do it and I'll see you when you get home that was my whole <laughs> my whole lesson really so I stalled it a few times going home on Ball Road but uh, I figured out all you got to do is give it enough gas and you're not going to stall it. And I was hooked for life. Wow. And then, so at this time, you're, you're, uh, you're how old this time in 72? Uh, probably 16. And you're going, and, and in 72, what is the, what's the hobby like down there? Cause you're kind of there in like the hot spot of Volkswagens, right? Oh, I really, I was in Orange County heaven right there. Uh, I lived in Anaheim and went to Buena Park and Orange all the time. And, and there was just, cow lookers were starting to come out and it was really catching on and everybody was noticing and I was like oh man this is awesome so I immediately started tearing apart my car and, and of course I was broke I didn't make any money and I had to do everything myself and most of the work I did certainly by today's standards wasn't very good but I remember dechroming the car once and I just pulled off the chrome and I didn't have a weld so I just got newspaper and bondo and sanded the holes and painted it with a rattle can primer and called it good that's it <laughs> and I, what I wanted, kind of I wanted, to, I wanted to, sorry, I wanted to lower the car mm -hmm. and uh of course i couldn't afford a selected drop it's like oh, way out of my way so i just drilled out the end caps and pulled out the torsion bars with some tools and, and cut them and stuck them back in and i uh, hammered them back in and when you got done you got a lowered front end but it didn't ride very good but it was it looked cool yeah, I, th I think that's everybody's first move, right? When you get the car, you're just like, I got to get it lower to the ground, and I've got to figure out a way to to make this thing look look cooler. Now, what were you were you able? What was the most customization you got on that car? Uh, I did the interior myself. Um, I did the uh, headliner myself. That took several tries. Mm -hmm. And um, we bought a '60, and we chopped it up, chopped the top off, and put in plexiglass windows and tried to make it a race car. <laughs> That's too cool. Yeah. And then as far as engine stuff like that, did you guys do it? Was it like, was there an engine shop you went to or did you do everything yourself or you just left it stock? I had a buddy that lived on the next street over and they were really into cars, V8s and they bought and sold cars every week. But uh, one of the brothers uh, had a 67, I think, and he was tearing it all up. And so I'd go over there and he could, he could, he could build motors. So I was kind of watch and help and hand him tools and stuff. And the more you're around guys that know what they're doing, the more you can pick up a few things here and there. Right. And I think it was uh, right after high school, I bought a 67. I put center lines on it and it was pretty sweet for the day. It was a 2180 and I had 48s, but it got stolen out of my garage one day. And um, I think the Buena Park police found it about three months later and returned it, but the engine was gone and the fenders were thrashed. And I just fixed it and moved on. And so as far as, so that's your second, your second Volkswagen was a 67? Uh, no, I probably had about six by then. I was just buying them and selling them cheap cars, you know, $300, $400. And then... You you stay in the scene pretty active for a while, or you kind of get out of it for a little bit and then get back in after? No, I stayed in. I stayed in. I bought a 66 Gia. Mm -hmm. I think I, it was like 18. I bought a 66 Gia convertible. It was in really bad shape. It leaked really bad in the rain. And I was um, working as a apprentice carpenter, and so I, I'd take it to work and haul lumber in the back of it. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> and uh, one story about that Gia couple stories I, I i took it to big bear one day with my brother one night we left on a friday night and i had a problem with the generator and it was it quit charging so by the time we got to the bottom of the mountain the lights wouldn't work anymore so you know a sane person would just call it quits but we just kept going <laughs> and i got pulled over one time on about halfway up at chp i got out and was messing around in the, in the deck lid and he's like what are you doing? And I told him, and he goes, well, if you can't fix it, you need to pull over. But as soon as he left, we just pushed started and kept going. 
Nice. And got up to the top of the mountain. We had to we had to pull over several times, and, and people would be driving up, and we'd get behind them and follow them so they could see where we were going. Yeah. And then um, we got up there and and um, probably had a couple drinks, and and driving on the backside of Big Bear there. I, I was driving too fast and I slid it into a mountain, Ooh. but I uh, didn't get a flat. So that was cool. And then the next morning we push started and head back home. No, that's, I mean, you know, it's always one of those things with Volkswagens. I mean, they, they're, they're always something that's going to test your ability to, to not quit, you yeah. know? And, and I think I've, I've, I've seen that in a lot of people in the hobby where, they, they persevere against adversity in certain circumstances when when most people would just walk away like, yeah, I'm kind of done with this. This is, uh, you know, I'm getting something more reliable. I'm getting something that's, you know, I can get a Honda or whatever and it won't leave me stranded. But there's something about Volkswagen people where they love, they love the car so much that they're willing to put up with all of the, you know, unplanned emergencies that happen when you own a Volkswagen and you're relying on it for daily you know, Boy, daily transportation. And when you don't have any money, it's worse. I, I, I one time I blew a fuse and I didn't have any fuses. So I, I got a stick of Wrigley's gum and used the uh, that paper foil and wrapped it around there and created a fuse so I could get home. Yeah. <laughs> I was at the Orange County Raceway uh, one time. I was competing in weekly drags with my sixty sixty, and there was buggins there, and I'd go all of those all the time, and I. I blew a tranny on the starting line, had to push it back, which is embarrassing, and then towed the car home uh, with my dad's pickup truck that I had to go get. And then I, I got it back on the driveway, and I was so upset. You talk about you know, not quitting. I, I pulled the engine in trams by myself at night, no lights. I was just pissed. I was like, no, I'm not leaving here till I'm done. Of course, in the morning, my dad wasn't very happy with me. Right. <laughs> But, you know, I think it's that, you know, there's there's that that level of determination that just, you know, it's, it's in all of us. And, and I think one of the things that, that I've realized is, you know, for me, realizing I could work on these things myself really opened me up to kind of eliminate that fear to tinker with stuff, especially something as important as a running driving vehicle, you know. And I think that that kind of opens people up to, to try some try some more things. Now, what did you end up doing out of school? What, what did you follow for a career path? And, and was the, the, the testing and trials of the Volkswagens, did that help you a little bit in that? Well, I, I got into um, um, being a union carpenter and got into the union and started getting into that. And then eventually I had to just drive pickup trucks and Volkswagens kind of went away for a while. And then, of course, you grow up and you get married and you have a family and and then it was just all about work and I started my own commercial contracting business and it was just like working six, seven days a week. And mm-hmm. That's that, There was only time for that really for the longest time. But then, um, you know, you, you get a point and I know this happened to so many people before me, but you get to a point where you're like, you know what? I want to get back to full seconds. I really love them. And I finally positioned myself in business where I could do that. And the kids were just getting a little bit older. Uh, they were getting into, you know, high school. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get back into it. And I, I came across a, uh, a really nice 67 Beetle. I had a blown engine. And I want to say it was like two grand. And it was a perfect car for me to get back into the hobby. So I, I got it and restored it. And I still have it. And she's actually perfect. And yeah, she's slow, but... She runs straight down the road, and, then, and once you get up to speed, you know the engine and trans are perfectly mated for each other. Right, and it's just something that you know, drives dead straight. It's like you know what, I'm I'm, I'm keeping this car till the day I die. And that's and that's the red one, the stock red one you have. Yeah, my stock red one. Yeah. And what's interesting is I was having this conversation with someone the other day, you know, because we all spend so much. I mean, my Type Thirty Four Gear had a two point six liter in it, and I know that you're. Your split had a big monster motor, I think 2332 or something in there. And, Uh you know, all these things end up having these giant motors. But, you know, when you get in a Volkswagen that's bone stock, they just, they're, like you said, they're perfectly matched, you know, to keep that car moving down the road where it doesn't feel like a slug if Uh you're just driving it for transportation. And so it's always been interesting to me that, you know, when some, and some of our most reliable ones, you know, I've got a little bit of a fleet of cars and the most, 
reliable ones are the most stock. And you just go out there, they could sit for months on end. You go out there, pump the gas three times, turn the key, and it fires. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Some of the old Volkswagens too, vintage Volkswagens. I know this might sound crazy, but if you stick your head in and close your eyes, they smell German. They have a smell to them that other cars don't have. Yeah. And I, just, I, I, I love them. Yeah, it's that it's that horse hair that's in the seats. It it once it kind of dries out, it gives off this smell. And out here in the desert, because so many cars sit in the heat for so long, it's such a distinct smell that the very first time I I, I was at a used car dealership with a friend of mine, and they had a square back in the back and it blown motor and all this stuff. And the guy said he'd take a hundred dollars for it. And I gave him twenty dollars, and I remember sitting in that car and smelling it. And this car was beat down and busted up. And eventually I had to go back and get my $20 deposit back because I couldn't come up with the other 80 to buy it. But but it was like, I, I remember so distinctly the smell because it's it's a really unique smell that's Volkswagen only. And I've often thought, what would happen if a, if a guy took horse hair out of a seat, put it in a little bag to hang from your rear view mirror in your new Volkswagen so it would smell like a classic Volkswagen in there? You know, <laughs> I've often thought of that idea because I thought, you know, that there's something distinctly, it's a sensory thing with those cars, the way... The steering wheel really feels, is. you know, the, the way the window, the window crank is so basic and simple yet so small, but everything just has a real fluid motion, you know? Yeah. So what, what, what you find the 67 in what year? Is that the early 2000s when you buy that? It was. And it so, was. You, and, and so you thought I'm going to, and a stock restoration, most people can do those at home because it's pretty basic. Send it out for paint, get it back, assemble the car, put everything back to stock and it's it's pretty doable in a garage as long as there's no major renovation work or that stuff. And then after that, is that when you buy the 52? And then what, what triggers that whole series of events to take place? Well, um, so, you know, you, you get the Beetle and you're diving it around and you're like, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. And then you start thinking, okay, well, now's the time I might start getting back into this. So I actually purchased a, a 57... A rag top oval window mm -hmm. and restored pe pe uh, pastel green and I kept it stock I had white walls and I installed a lot of NOS accessories I had a kind of a, a connection to those and um, I drove that car for around a while I ended up selling it to my good friend John Doherty who then was also getting back into the Volkswagen scene and he was he was like king of the burnouts way back when yeah and um he um he's a great guy he's a wonderful mechanic um he, he can just basically fix anything and and um, we joined dkk together uh or he brought me in but uh, he turned the car into a cow looker and installed a 2332 with 48s and it's it's really nice and then i bought a one day i was driving santa Ana and the whole second deal was there and i just stopped in and I bought a brand new 2000 Turbo Beetle. Mm -hmm. It had that color that was only like, we called it internet yellow. And I gave it to my wife, it's kind of surprised her. And then later on, it became my daughter's high school car. And uh, then I started getting real serious and ended up getting the bus and and the um, and the split window. So you had the, so you, the, yeah, the bus was done first because the, the, you know, we were talking earlier, the issue that your bus is in, which is, the November 2003, which was your second feature in the magazine. Your your first feature was in uh, May of 2002 with kind of the the Gates collection type thing. This the 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 pastel green, the red bug, and then the new beetle. And then right. a year later, you have the 23 window, the 57 23 window, which has all the kids cleaning it at the gas pump and all that stuff, which is really a cool. Uh, you know, a, a real cool cover. So you get the bus, and this is obviously before buses go bananas cost-wise. What what was the process in building the bus, and who built that? Well, you know, um, <laughs> one thing I learned right away was that VW buses cost a lot more than yeah. Beatles to restore. <laughs> but I, I think the car was found, um, it was just an empty shell rotting away in a Colorado farm. And we picked it up, but I, I still think I paid ten grand for it. And the, the cool thing though was it had all the glass, particularly the corner windows. Yeah. And I'd already purchased the fifty-two by then, 
but I was storing it and I started searching for NOS parts. Not, and I had something special planned for the 52, so that sat for a while. And so I started working on the bus. But um, yeah, there was a, there was a, the, the whole build on the bus was, was fun and, uh, and pretty involved. I, I wanted uh, something that my family and five kids at the time could, could enjoy. So, you know, when it was done, I, I could pick them up at high school after lunch or after school and we could go to lunch or drive around and their friends would jump in and I'd have seven or eight people in the bus and there was no problem because it had a big motor and, and um, could easily pull up hill with eight people in it. Yeah. But it, it, it was, it was a fun, fun event uh, for us. We took it to a lot of shows and my kids would come with me and, and the way we finished it inside uh, with some TVs and some video game things it allowed them to enjoy the show. No, it's, it, it's definitely a super clean bus and who, what, how long did it take that to get built? Because it was, you're in the magazine a year previously and then you're in the, you know, yeah, we got it done pretty quickly. I did it shop in orange. Um, but that kind of goes to my business sense where I'm in my uh, contracting where you have to be knowledgeable about every single detail when you're putting together a project. So when I look at it, when I look at a VW project, I, I sketch it all out in advance. I don't like to leave anything to chance. And so thinking about colors and connections and parts and whatever it might be. And so with that project, you, you ended up, you had everything ready to go before that car hit the paint booth. So once that car got out, it was just put it together. Everything's there and you're not waiting on everything. Right. Right. It's I'm a contractor. I'm a, I'm a granite and tile contractor. And I can tell you the world is much different today than it used to be 20 years ago when it comes to contracting, <laughs> especially when it comes to, you know, I, I tell people this all the time, a good superintendent that runs a project is building the job before he's even to that point. And so he's making phone calls, coordinating products, time and material. And it's the same with the project, you know, and, and, and especially it's funny in, in remodeling. I tell people all the time that, that a lot of people want to general their own remodel job. So I say, no problem. Just make sure you have everything. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's quick. It's two days to get it. I said, no, get it here. Have it sitting in the garage. Cause if it's yeah. not odds are everything's going to be, that'll be delayed. This is on back order. All these things will happen. And then, it's going to stop the train and you're going to be upset, you know? So it's, you know, it, it makes it so much more enjoyable when a project goes as planned and, and really, you know, the most, the best planning up front, you're always going to run into incidentals that happen along the way, which is that with any project, whether it's a car construction or whatever, and the more planning you do up front and the more preparation, the more parts, all that stuff, the reward and payoffs a lot better because it's like, okay, we, we circumvented some possible issues because we had the parts, we had the pieces or we had a plan for it, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's how I attack everything really. And, and uh, create a big binder and, and start sectioning it out with some um, dividers as to what I'm trying to achieve. But, you know, building the bus was fun. It was, a, it was, it was eye opening in terms of the costs. Uh, the end result was pretty amazing, you know, but I, um, I was working with, uh, Doug Berg and Mark over at Berg and they helped me put together this. Well, I started with it, with a two zero zero seven, but it, it really didn't have enough power. So I went to the 2332 and then Mark customized some 48s for me. And when you put 48s in a bus, if, if they're not done just right, it's not going to run good on the bottom end, but this thing could run like a stalker. But if I need to get on it, it you know, driving up the hill with orange, it would just take off. So it was, it was great. Fitted it with a custom Berg shifter and RK Smith you know, gave me some flawless alloys for it. And we did a few other things to it that were special. Um, my friend Tug Berg is, is a genius really. And he, um, I went to him and I'd, as I would a lot. And I would say, look, Doug, I, I want to do something, one of my cars and I want something nobody has and nobody's ever thought of. And we'd sit there and talk and he'd get some sketches and start things. And then he'd get on the computer and draw it. And pretty soon he's machining it. And, and that's how he came up with the, um, 
it's actually kind of subtle, but I, I did a, a upper pulley that is a BRM pulley. Right. Um, it's the lower pulley. It's never been done before or since. And, and it really set off the, the engine compartment. And then uh, he created a um, custom logo plaque and he put it in the, uh, in the back on the tin. And it's still there if you, if you see it. Um, uh, I actually saw it at, uh, you know, the, the comedian Fluffy now owns that bus. Oh really? And it, it was on Jay Leno's garage, and you can see you can still see the uh, the plaque in there. So, so the plaque yeah. he made the plaque he made is the little mini BRM that's on the heater hose, like right by the in front of the heater hose. No, oh, it says I think it says something like "custom made by Randy Gates" or something like that, and it's still there. Oh, very uh, cool. So another another good story uh, on the bus. I I was uh, driving back from. A VW Drag Day event, and um, I'm transitioning from the 91 to the 55, and mm-hmm. with my son Duncan, and and when we run out of gas, and it's like oh boy, and so we're coasting along in the right lane, and I just managed to make the off ramp, and I'm like oh man, we're gonna stall it right here, and, and just got over the top, and the light was green, and I, I I coasted it all the way down through the light and right into the 76 station in Orange there on Lincoln. And, was able to fill up and so it didn't cost us anything oh nice <laughs> nice and so now at this time you've got so you've got the 23 window you get that thing finished you, you show it off at the show and at this time you've got the split window project but it's not underway yet correct and how does that how does that come together like who you choose to build it all the all the stuff that you do with that like what's your plan and how many times does that change during that process because you know the bus is done and you're now getting in november of 2003 you're getting accolades in the magazine the split window comes out and that's in 2005 that's in the magazine so yeah i think you know the bus ended up being in like 10 magazines and a couple languages and and um you know everybody sells cars that they wish they wouldn't have and that's the one i probably wish i didn't have sold the bus yeah, I was at I was at Buggin um, a couple of seasons later, and and I'm standing in line with my daughter Megan, and we're gonna get a hot dog. And uh, somebody comes up to me and says, "Hey, you you on the bus, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah." Uh-huh. And they're like, "Well, I want to buy it." I'm not to be a dick, but I was like, "Yeah, I know everybody does." And right. they go, "No, I, I really do." And I go, "Well, it's not really for sale, you know. I just it's a family thing. My kids are here. Just, that's what we do." And he's like, "No, no." So he comes back about 10 minutes later and makes me a pretty good offer. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great, but no, that's not for sale. And he comes back and makes me another offer. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And then finally he comes back and he offers me, I want to say it was like 90 grand. And what year and is I, this? This is 05 or 04? Oh, uh, it's probably six, something like that. So this is after the split windows built. Yeah. And you don't need to sell anything. And you're like, yeah, I don't really I, need I, it sell it not really and and uh i started talking to the guy he's like look i'm a fireman i'm in Huntington beach i got a family i just really want this thing and so and i'm only a week because i said sure whatever you know and he bought it and then later i saw it resell for one hundred fifty thousand, and then <laughs> now it's on jay Leno's garage and it's like really the only thing i wish i had back well you know the, the funny part is i was i happened to be a bug in with a friend of mine that had a a, a 21 window that was built um, here in Vegas, it was like a gold and white and 17 inch Porsche wheels. And we're standing there bugging and a, and a guy comes up and says, I'd like to buy your bus. And he's like, eh, it's not really for sale. And he says, and I think this was about, this might've been Oh five. And he says, I'll give you cash for it. And he's like, nah, well, what are you offering? He's like, what do you want for it? And he just threw out a number. He goes $60,000. Now back then 60,000 bucks was huge money for a v- I mean, 90,000 was incredible back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was, that was like, you better sell it. Cause you're never, gonna, <laughs> you're never going to get that offer again, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it, it's just crazy. And this guy, he dropped, he delivered the bus to Brentwood and the guy gave him a paper sack with 60,000 cash in it. And it was just, <laughs> it was the wildest thing. You know, we, and we look back at how the, the hobbies changed so much and that being a press bumper, 23 window, 57, you know, 
it's it's a it's a cool desirable bus but there's also something to be said for the fact that you know you're the guy that built it and had that thing you know put together like that so and that and 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 the credit being that it's still that way today yeah. my my friend's bus suffered a terrible fate of being turned into they sent it to Galpin Autosports and they made it the Scooby bus <laughs> Like he had all leather interior in it. They dyed it all purple, put flowers on the side, painted the wheels purple. Like it was, yeah. If you ever look up Scooby bus and it's a VW bus that they made, that was my buddy's golden wow. white 21 window. That That's an original Vegas bus that we built. We helped him build out here. And uh, <laughs> I look at him every time like, bet you wish you didn't sell that. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing if it stays the way you built it, right? Knowing that people just appreciate it the way it was. A whole yeah, different- yeah. The one thing I kind of wanted to get across in this conversation is it's really important to me is that I've met an incredible amount of really good people in this hobby. Oh yeah. And I, there's people out there with a tremendous amount of skills and knowledge. And the thing is, is they'll share it with you with anybody, you know, if you just want to sit down and have a beer, they will, they will teach you things. They'll tell you things. And you can say, Hey, I'm looking at your car and I see this, and that, and they'll help you. And, and, you know, that doesn't get lost on me. It's a, uh, these people that, that you interview in the podcast, I, I really admire them and it, it's really fun. I, I'm driving around the freeway and I'm listening and I'm like, man, if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't have got into those things. Yeah. Yeah. And and the uniqueness of their knowledge, like it's, it's almost like it's something that's lost from this world, you know, cause in construction, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you found a, a, a carpenter. He knew how to do everything. He wasn't a framer, a guy that does walls, a guy that does fascias, a guy, you know, he did everything. If it was wood, he could yeah. do it, you know? And it's kind of the same way with the VW hobby, right? Like some of these guys, when they get into some of these things, whether they're engine builders, you know, or, you know, you go down a, uh, the deep well of talking, listening to Fred Simpson from performance technologies, talking about heads and calculations and all this stuff. And it's like where we look at something that's so basic and these guys, it's their passion, you know, it's everything that they do, which is what makes the hobby so great. You know, we, we just had my event out here, uh, which, what you know, we call it one crazy weekend and it, and it's a, it's a strip cruise Friday night, a little car show Saturday, and then a poker run, Saturday night, but it's, it's all stationed. It all starts off at, at the Orleans hotel. And the reason that that was important to me is that the best times I had at a car show were going to the VW classic weekend, driving in from Vegas, staying at the host hotel, meeting all these different people from all across the country. that are in the VWs. And then we kind of forge these friendships, just hanging out at the hotel, running around to the open houses, doing that stuff. And the feedback I got from so many people on my event, which really made me happy was that so many people that you think wouldn't be connecting are connecting and hanging out and goofing around together like guys from different ends of the hobby, but they're all there at the hotel. So they all kind of, you know, there's all something that threads us together through this hobby. And it, it was so enjoyable to me to see so many people making connections from, from the first one we did four years ago. There's group, there's a group that went on the first poker run together all these guys all want to be in the same group every year and they're all from different parts of the country, but they all connected down here and they're, they're all so uniquely different in what they do. But when it comes to the the hobby, like they're all just, they're all here and they're all in, you know, and it's so, it's so nice to see. And it's like, and I don't know if it's just the VW scene or if it's because of the, the, the length of time the VW scene has been around, but again, all these guys that just have so much skill and talent and, you know, from the, yeah, from the Bergs to everybody. I mean, you, you'll sit and talk. I, I did that not long ago. I was at a drag race with Doug Berg and I went up to the one up in uh, Northern California and, you know, Doug's telling me, he says, look, man, don't stress out. You're not racing him. You're racing yourself. Just do what yeah. you did the last time. <laughs> and I'm in the car just overthinking everything. And he's like. Hey man, just take it easy. You know, Doug says, just take it easy, man. Just <laughs> you know, I, I I developed a lot of close relationships and friends and lasting ones. You know, I, I'd like to tell you about a couple of them. Sure. I, I know that you've uh, know RK. RK Smith, um, 
I hold in high regard. Uh, he is just a mild mannered, true, genuine person and friend. Yeah. And his family and my family are close. And, you know, I remember the, the day I met him, um, me and my wife went to this, uh, me and my wife, Amy, we went to this show at Wolfburg's West in Anaheim. And I drove the 67 and she drove the 57 bagged up. And we're in line like everybody else and nothing special. And um, Arkay is standing there and he, and he sees us and he's like, ooh, what is this? And, and uh, he's like, come on over here. And he helps me get inside, uh, get in, into a primo parking spot inside the warehouse and we started talking. And my two cars had really never been seen in public. This is before he shot them. And, and, and uh, we just developed a friendship that morning that lasted through today. Yeah. And, um, you know, I listened to the podcast with RK and I listened very intently. He is one of the most knowledgeable and kind people you're going to meet in this hobby. Oh, absolutely. And I, I like to say that RK promotes VW dreams. And it's just so true. Um, I'm thinking back 2006 maybe seven, RK set up an invite for me and Amy to come to the big, uh, to the big Hawaiian show, the Shaka show. Yeah. Honolulu. So we're like, okay. And, and he hooked us up with Alex Chin, who owns a shop called Island V Dub. And, um, Alex invited us to his home and he gave us a, a black Kia convertible to drive for the cruise and met all these lovely people. And, and, and they all love their cars over there. And, you know, it's just so easy to have a good time. Of course, you're in Hawaii, right? You're right on the right. water. And it's, just, oh man, it's just so great. Um, yeah, RK, I, I, when I met RK, um, we, he, he didn't shoot my first car, Bruce did, but RK shot the Gia and he's so into it, you know, that mm -hmm. I've, I've met, I've worked with photographers and stuff before where they're just kind of like, yeah, whatever. You know, RK is just like, oh yeah, that'd be totally bitching. We should do this too. And we should do it. Like he's really into it. Right. And, and for me, yeah. you know, my Gia, which was on the cover of Hot BWs, the, the, the cover shot, I said, look, RK, my favorite shots are like garage shots. Like where you see a garage, a couple cars, a toolbox, whatever like a, like a, like a cover shot that has a, like yours did yours was a scene, right? It was the kids uh -huh. cleaning and doing that stuff. Like for me, those are my favorite cover shots because it's a still picture, but there's movement, there's action, there's life going on inside. It's not just a static vehicle. And, yeah. uh, and you know, I remember when I shoot my car with him, we're, you know, we, cause he's, he, he's into all kinds of cars, right? Hot rods and everything. And so we started talking and he knew that I had a, a couple Corvairs and he says, Oh, calls me and he goes, Hey, check this out. I was, I was in the California, I happened to be going to his house, just stopped by his house to visit. He goes, check this out. And he had a big poster board that was like, it was a, it was, a, it was almost like a, a paper thing that was mounted on wood from the sixties that went up in a dealership. And it had on one side, it had all the Nova twos. And on the other side, it had all of the uh, Corvairs from 1966. And so he says, yeah, you want this thing right here? He's like, I'm going to cut this thing in half. I'm going to frame this one for my car, for my Novas. He's like, I know you're into Corvair. So I have that hanging in my game room at my house, but it's this really cool dealer uh, piece that was hanging on the wall. And he's just, he's just such a solid, solid guy, man. He's every time I see that guy, I smile, you know, because he's just, he's a good soul to the core, you know? Yeah. We did three shoots together. He, he shot my 57, 67 and Turbo Beetle at my house in Villa Park. And that was kind of fun. Um, and then when it came time to shoot the bus, um, that's where where our friendship was really tight. And it's like, you know, let's go scouting. And we drive around all kinds of locations everywhere in Orange County looking for a spot. We finally found this Orange County Fairgrounds we we're gonna use for the basic uh, location. And then there was this mock gas station there. We're like, okay, this is gonna be perfect. So. He said it'd be cool if we could get my kids in it. And I'm like, okay, because he knew all the kids. And and, and so it's like, okay, we'll, we'll plan it. And it will be, it'll be like a working gas station. Right. So uh, a friend of mine owned a, a 76 station uh, in Villa Park. He's, he's passed on now, but and it was called Phil's Unical. So I go over there and I go, Phil, I need some uniforms and hats for my kids. So he gives me hats and uniforms for the boys. And then we got some like 
burger hop style uniforms for my daughters and the shot came off and it was just oh yeah perfect it's just perfect yeah it's just <laughs> And it's crazy to look at that, and that was 20 years ago. Yeah. You know? And we shot the split. Uh, well, we did the kind of the same thing. Uh, I really wanted the shot to be nice for something as accomplishment as that car had. And, and we're, we're driving around, and, and um, well, first of all, he, he went to San Diego several times. The car was at VW Paradise, and, and uh, uh, he shot a lot of the detail there up on a rack when the body was off and then uh and he he drove out to arizona with buddies and made some shots there and then when it came time to shoot the, the outside of the car we, we pulled up in huntington beach and we're at the united states post office and, and we're like hmm, this looks great they had this mural on the wall was really bitching and so we went and asked the postmaster hey can we have permission to shoot a car here and he's like yeah sure whatever so the, the day comes and, and we get the car there and the postal people come out and they're like, Hey, you can't do that. You know? So we're like, Hey, no, we got permission. It's like, oh, okay. Okay. So he, he does the shoot and comes out great. And I'm like, the mural was awesome. And, and it had touched the blue of the car and, and, um, but the, the, the parking lot had like, um, you know, the painted stalls. Right. And I'm like, what can't do about that. He goes, Oh, no worry. I'll Photoshop those out. So he just made those go away. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's it, it's it's a real it's a real cool shot. Now, what's the story on the split window? How does that build come together? What's your original plan, and and how does that whole thing unfold? Well, uh, that's a detailed story. Um, so I've got the the split. I, I, I what happened was is uh, this is you know way way older than it is today. We do things on the internet, but I found it online somewhere it was i think it was in wales and it was painted green and, and it was just sitting there on you know garage and and um i just got a couple of crummy pictures of it and talked to the guy a couple of times he was like a family guy and he was gonna do something with it but it had been sitting there for four or five years and didn't do anything so i make a deal and get the card ship it over here and i hired somebody to help me get it through customs and comes to long beach from there, it gets delivered to my office in Orange. And uh, the trans was in, but the engine was sitting in the back seat. And it had all the parts. Uh, it had the, you know, the, the 25 horsepower motor, the five wheels, three and a half inch wheels, and all the trim, and everything was still on it. Um, it just uh, needed a complete redo, you know. So I just parked it. And my plan was to just start looking for NOS parts. And that was a big chore to find those parts. And some of the parts on that car are just way beyond. Right. Um, but what happened was, is I ended up talking about being lucky. I was searching the internet like I did every night after work. And, and uh, I came across this guy who was in Germany who his dad was a VW dealer and he passed on. And he had all these NOS parts in these storage places. And so the kid has a young family and he's like, I don't know what to do with these things. And he didn't really know what they were worth. And I sure did. And, and, uh, he says, well, um, they're not even all posted. I mean, so I called him up and I just started talking to him and say, hey, do you have this? this is I end up getting, um, NOS in the box, uh, 52, uh, door handles and, wow. and uh, deck lid and, and, and uh, pulls and, and hood pulls and, and just all kinds of really cool knobs and stuff that he had. And, and then I ended up getting um, an SWF kit in the box. It was a, a window washer kit and it had the complete kit with the, with the, with the knob on the dash. And it was a, it had a chrome dual sprayer unit for the window. That was awesome. Wow. And I, so I got all of those parts and then, um, and I was working with, uh, Phil Weiner in, in Florida and he had a, a treasure chest of, of NOS parts, pretty expensive, I can say, but, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And, and, um, from the guy in Germany, also, I got a brand new set of brand new in the box, um, semaphores. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I just kept gathering all these parts. And then that kind of snowballed. And I'm like, okay, I'm going for it. I'm going to do something that nobody's done. I don't care what it costs. I'm going to do it. And I just put together this huge book of every single possible detail that you can imagine or, or even dream. And then what I really needed to do was put together my team. Mm -hmm. And I just had so many friends and I just needed to work with the best people and I needed to sit down with them. And I, I got them all together and we would have these meetings and I go, look, this is my dream. This is what I'm trying to do. I just want to know, can you support that? And they all played a critical role in my success in this. It's, just, you know, it's, it's not really me. Um, but uh, the first thing was I wanted to get Buddy Hill. And I can tell you that Buddy Hill is magic. That guy has vision beyond. Yeah. And, and I love him. And he, uh, he can... He can listen to what I was trying to do, and he can say, you know, we could do this, and we could do that. He had a lot of great ideas. Some of the things on the car, he just did, knowing that I would like it. And then he's like, well, Randy, this is what I did. And he was wondering, what am I going to say, you know, because it, it's, it's off my sheet. It's not, not on my plan. But, for instance, he took the – it's a small thing. I don't know if a lot of people ever saw it, but he – the tunnel in the back, the inspection plate, mm -hmm. took that off. He cut out a section and installed a piece of viewing glass so that you could see the detail of the connection in there. And when the seat was raised, when I would show it, if you looked in there, you could see right through into the connection. It was really amazing. Yeah. And then, you know, his access to um, CNC machines, he made all kinds of one-off parts that nobody had ever seen before. Yeah. And that really came out in, you know, in the pictures from arcade, but also when I first debuted the show, uh, at DKP and then, and then, um, the bug in the class, excuse me, uh, people would come there with, uh, these long sticks with mirrors and cameras and videos. And they were, what is that? And where'd you get that? And, you know, all this crazy stuff. So, um, but, uh, but he did a fantastic job. He really did. And um, I can't recommend him enough. Uh, and he, he put me together with a guy in, in, in Arizona that did the interior. And we bought all the material from the lady in Germany. Mm -hmm. you know, right now, making the pillows. And everything was just tits perfect. You know, every line, um, every stitch was just, just the way it was. Because I would come into a meeting and say, look, this is exactly what I want and I'm willing to pay for it and I got to get it just right. Right. And everybody stepped up and it was like, it was a whole different game. Um, you know, the end result was a different game, but when I was doing it, I was, I had this plan. This is what I wanted to do. And then my friends down at, um, VW paradise are, <laughs> they're also off the charts. You know, Chris and Jason Laffer are, they're geniuses. And, you know, I would go and watch family race the drags, dragster down at the drag strip in Las Vegas and be standing right there and watch all the teamwork and everything that it took. And there was no compromise in that car that they had. And they did the same thing with my car. There was no compromise. And it, Chris built these uh, incredible one-off fuel injection system and rails and, and, and made into these carburetors and 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 put the motor together and it just made really big horsepower so big that i didn't even want to say it really in the magazine and um they were all really into it and it was it was it was it was really awesome and, and the day we put it on the dyno down there was hair splitting it was so exciting really yeah and then you know my my friends at Berg enterprises um <laughs> I just have such a special place in my heart for them. Um, you know, Doug is a genius. He can do anything, and he's built me so many one-off parts just right out of his mind. And he's very compassionate and kind. And Mark uh, works in a shop who builds all the putters, I'm sorry, the shifters and what have you. He, he, um, 
he's done all kinds of stuff for me in his shop and in my shop with the bus. And, and, and he was the first one actually to drive the 52 on the street. <laughs> and he didn't baby it at all. And, um, and then uh, Clyde has done all kinds of uh, fantastic head work for me. Uh, he, he's really experienced and yet very humble. They all are. Uh, and Gary is a, uh, Besides being an unbelievable driver, he is an um, he is a genius. He's off the charts with 48s. Yeah, that's something for me that that you're like, wow, how can they look that good? They're you know, and I never was one for going for chrome or any of that stuff. I wanted it just right or just polished, and everything was just perfect. And um, you know, even the guys uh, uh, at the counter. Uh, in, in the Berg's office um, were super, super nice to me. And, and, and I kind of had a relationship where I just went in the back and did anything I wanted. But Tim and Andy and Kathy and, of course, Mrs. Berg is amazing. I know everybody calls her D, but I don't want to call her Mrs. Berg. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just it's just a, a, a really an eclectic group of people that are really into um, what they do. What about, um, so how did you first hear of Buddy? Like, because Buddy was in Arizona and he wasn't super well known um, at the time. I, I think I saw him at a bug in one time. And the way I was is I would come up, and not really say a lot, but really stare at the details. I was just, I'm such a detailed guy. Mm -hmm. Stare and go, okay, what do we got here? We got here, okay. And then maybe had a little conversation with him and then maybe called him one more time. And then I just call him up and says, look, this is what I want to do. And do you want to be a part of it? And he's like, yeah, I'm all in. So, um, yeah, cause I remember when you were debuting the car, you had these stickers. <laughs> that's a, that, that's a, that's a kickback way to uh, Al Martinez. Being yeah. body and stuff. When I was uh, in high school in Santa Ana, I had an ROP program. So I'm working out for a couple hours each day and I'm at Al Martinez body shop. You know, I'm learning how to sand Porsches with hand and block sand and stuff like that. And at that time, his son had this amazing black uh, beetle yeah. that was winning, winning everything at Buggins at, at Orange County International Raceway. And that was back when uh, they had the engine pool contests, you know, so you'd, you'd practice, see if you could get your engine out how fast. And right. they also had, they don't do anything more, but they used to have slalom drags for Volkswagens with big fat tires and do all of that but uh but they had a sticker there that said who's al martinez and it was a great promotional item right so i didn't tell buddy this but i was thinking you know i'm getting ready to do the car so i had a friend who was an artist i had a couple friends who were artists actually and and um i said look i want to do this thing and so we came out with this who's buddy hill and i made a whole bunch of them up i put them on the car and i just handed them out to anybody who wanted them i, I probably still have more yeah, yeah, I need but, one. Uh, <laughs> Earmark one for me. Like, okay, that's cool. That's cool, you know. And it's kind of like uh, when I did the shirts, um, uh, Mike Lawless was this amazing racer who had this um, dark blue gear. Mm -hmm. Very consistent. I'd watch him all the time. But he was also a great graphic artist. So I, I called him up and says, hey, I want to I wanna do some shirts of my cars. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like you go to bug in and they got the bug in shirt and whatever and drag day shirt. So I wanted to get some. So he designed the front logo for me. It's a Gates collection. It was very cool with the Volkswagen guy and it was a playoff on that. And then so he did the bus and it came out so amazing. Uh, colors are awesome. And, and even put the, the detail was actually had the license plate on the shirt that was on the bus. Right. So I said, OK, now we're going to do one for the 52. Nobody really knew about it yet, but so I sent him some lead pictures. He's like, "Oh, okay, what is this?" And he comes up the thing. I says, "Look, my my kind of my idea here is to do a kind of take on um, a burger joint place, like um, like In-N-Out Burger, right? They got their shirts. And so we want to put the fifty-two in that kind of a deal." And he started working it up, and it just really I see the uh, the, uh, the print, the artwork, right? And it's really looking good. And I said at the last minute, I said, "Here, what I'm gonna do? We're gonna." We're going to name the burger joint. We're going to call it our case. Well, I cool. didn't tell and then I had the shirts made and I handed RK two of them and he looked at it and he gave me that big smile and his classic 
oh, cool. You know, so uh, that was just a tribute to RK, one of the last forever. Yeah. And, um, so. No, that's it. That, I mean, that's just, it, it. you know, it's a cool, it, it's, it's cool to hear how it comes together because there's so much that you can't get from just the pictures in the magazine and the limited amount of words that they can write up on the car, you know? And w- like when that car, when that split window was finished and you saw the reaction from people, because I mean, that car made a huge statement when it came out. I mean, that was like the car when it came out, I think even more than the bus because nobody oh, yeah. at that time had really put that kind of, this is before everybody started grabbing a split window and doing all kind of stuff with them. And there was still a few splits around, but they were still relatively hard to find. And nobody was definitely buying splits at that time and going that deep over the top on them. Um, there wasn't, yeah. there wasn't a lot of cars that were that deep on the top. And so what was, I mean, what was your impression when that car was done? How, <sighs> did, how did you feel when you debuted that car? Well, you never really know. Right. But, um, for the unveiling, um, we took the car over to RK's in Fullerton, parked it over there mm-hmm. on Friday night of the show. And then the show took off, and then, you know, cars are parking there at, you know, one, two o'clock, maybe yeah. even earlier. Yeah. And so um, I had somebody take my bus over and had a pretty, pretty good spot. And, and somebody had saved me a spot right in front. And so we kind of just, uh, I just drove it in. Uh, probably two hours or so after the show had really started. And it was like hysteria. It really was. It was crazy. <laughs> and uh, The excitement was, was big. And, and my friends were there. The Bergs were there. His buddy was there. There's a lot to do. And all the DKP guys, which are amazing guys, and DKK guys were there. And it's like, you know, this is, this is cool. And... Um, it was 30 people deep all the way around it. Yeah. And then it kind of died down and <laughs> I went over and opened the deck lid and then, then it was 30 people deep again. They're like, you gotta be kidding me. And so it was, it was something. And then, you know, I gets grace with the D, DKP award and it's like, okay. And I think I got out of there about 11 o'clock at night Then they got the classic the next morning and we're there like at five or six and got a spot, Rich Campbell, bless his heart, he, he's, he, he's done so many things for this um, hobby that uh, he doesn't get enough um, accolades, really, but, but he had set me up there, and the, and, the, and the crowds were bigger and more of the same, a lot of positive comments, and a, a lot of things I didn't expect, you know, people trying to climb under the car and <laughs> doing different things. And, right. You know, so it takes best in show there, and then pretty much every show I took it to best in show, best in show, best in show. Won the 05 uh, bug in 05 bug. And I think it won America's most beautiful Volkswagen, right? Yeah. That was bug in 32. Yeah. And yeah, it's most beautiful Volkswagen. And then later in Europe, it's voted the best Volkswagen in the world. I think is, is what I recall. You know, thinking back in retrospect, I, I think my efforts and ideas came out the way I wanted them to, but it's really because I had this incredible team and, and we were able to dream of something and then pull it off. And it's been lasting, you know, there's tons and tons of people who have seen the magazines. It's been in like 20 magazines, six languages, uh, you know, almost 20 years later, it still feels pretty good. You know, the end goal, the bar was set high. I, I know that. And maybe people thought I was crazy and I probably was. But I just wanted to do it, and I just did it. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is when I when I set out to build the Gia, I did, it wasn't a buddy shop first, and it was at another paint shop getting painted. And I said, the guy sent me an invoice, and it said heart attack. Hey, don't have a heart attack. The you know the car's <laughs> got the, the car got a lot of work done this week, and you know you're gonna love it. It's gonna be great. I said, listen, as long as I can park it next to Randy Gates split window and give him a run for the money. That's the standard we're going for. You know what I mean? Like that, that's literally what my email says. Like, listen, if that's what it costs to get it that nice, then that, then, then, then it is what it is. But I, yeah. let's, let's be clear at the standard I want. Well, long story short, the car ended up at buddies. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just, it was, it was just night and day. 
And then to see, because, you know, when I have a buddy working on a project of mine, you know, he gets so excited and fired up because he loves it. You know what I mean? Like he loves yep. the ideas, the, the the coming up with different things back and forth. And um, he's got my split window down there right now. And, um, you know, it's 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 refreshing to be. It's not like if you take it to a body shop and there's like, yeah, whatever, Volkswagen, Schmokeswagen, you know, we're going to get the paint on it and get it out of here. And it's like the difference of working with somebody that's in the hobby is like they're passionate about the way that things are fitted and finished and they, they treat it like a Mercedes, not like a Volkswagen. You go to a body shop, they're going to treat it like what's this guy getting all excited about this dumb Volkswagen for. And meanwhile, yeah. they, you know, they, they just don't get it. And it's so, it's nice to have, to have people you work with that are as excited as you are. Now, one question yeah. I have is when the car was featured first, the magazine had BRMs on it and then you switched to gas burners. What caused the change? What was the reason for the change of the wheels? I actually had three sets, uh, center lines and the BRMs and the gas burners. And RK took pictures of a car with all three. Oh, really? And we just kind of went with those. Yeah. Yeah, I got a, a cool story about the crotch cooler if you got time. Yeah. Um, the crotch coolers were, you know, they only made them for like 14 months or something. Right. And, and um, we decided right away that we would zinc plate the screens. And that, that was kind of the easy part. But the gaskets were very, very difficult. And nobody had that I had known had ever had a split window with the correct gaskets. And I'm like, how do you do this? And I went over to BFY in Orange, and I was looking around and studying. They had a couple of splits in there, but they were all really old and cracked. And, falling apart, missing pieces. I'm like, how do you do this? How do you do this? And part of my mind is I'm a linear thinker and I, I kept thinking linear and I, I bought probably 50 pieces of weather stripping and would try to form it around and glue it and none of it looked right. And I just kept throwing it away. Oh, this is a waste of time. I finally went to um, my mirror and glass shop and I was describing to the owner what I was trying to do and he's like, oh, that's easy. He just thought differently. He goes, all you do is take a piece of uh, sheet rubber and, and um, you just cut the inside and outside and make a one piece gasket. So we did that. It was just like that. And we glued them in and they were perfect, but they had to be because if you don't get the right thickness and the crotch cooler doors don't shut right, they don't flush out or, or indented. So it was a big deal to get it right. And it's amazing how much effort went into just that one detail. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, you know, and, and with people, with people investing like dragging cars out, older cars and the continued search for more and, you know, more rare, more older, more this, more that it's, it's mandated that people in the hobby really, you know, we have all these people with different backgrounds, you know, whether it's construction or manufacturing or whatever. And I've got a guy that's coming on the podcast soon that he works for a company that makes pistons for all millions of pistons a year. And he's convinced them to manufacture high performance VW pistons that, that are coming out new to the market. And it's like, you know, all us VW guys are planted everywhere like spies. And then we use our influence and whatever our influence or our ingenuity or our resources to manufacture or make stuff that's missing. And that's, what's been so cool about the hobby, having such a diverse group of people that are into it, that a lot of things, you know, either get manufactured, somebody makes it themselves and tell somebody else how to make it and things get kind of put back on the market. So I've always thought that yeah. that was really a neat thing about the hobby, how so many people are able to to just create things that are long lost and, and not available anymore. And then things that no one thinks about today that are cool, five years from now, they're just the coolest thing ever, you know? Yeah. So now you also have uh, another cow look car that you that you built that there. You have another 67 that's kind of a cow look monster, right? That you built. After. I love 67s, yeah. Now, I, let, uh, now let me ask this question real quick before we finish on the split. What made you sell the split window? Why did you decide to sell it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think the answer is, is fear. The, the car was so incredible even on the bottom of the car, it was finished to a higher level than most people's top of the cars. Right. And so when a fly landed on it, it caused stress. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? This isn't fun. Where I drove the bus around, it was great fun. The kids jumped in at ice cream, popcorn, didn't matter. The 52 was just, ugh, it was just, um, 
it was just stressful. Yeah. It was stressful. Oh, I understand. I totally understand. The same with my Gia. It was just like, you can't relax where you're at because it's like something's going to happen. And then you're going to be bummed out because it can never be back the way it was when it was first finished. Yeah. And I would get notes from people all over the world. And they would say, you know, I got your magazine blown up and it's all over my wall. And I just want to do that. Or I just want to get that. Or I want to see that. Or I haven't, I haven't never seen it. Where can I see it? And over and over, or, or you inspired me to do this and that. So that was the good part of it. But the having it when I was done was was difficult. So um, anyway, yeah. So it. so you decided to turn the page on that one, and then you built this the red sixty seven afterwards. The the cow look sixty seven. Yeah. What happened was is uh, uh, I really when you're driving around a stock sixty seven all the time. <laughs> You know, at some point you go, I want to want to go fast. And so, um, and I was drag racing and I was racing Porsches at the track. So I want, I like going fast. So, um, I acquired a, a 67 that Darren Dugan built in orange It's a beautiful car, you know, running tens NOS system made over 300 horsepower and I bought it, but it was a race car. I mean, it was like, no, oh, I can't drive this on the street. So my friend, John Doherty and I, we tore the car apart and installed a new interior and seats and made a bunch of improvements. And I had Dave Greiner uh, detune the motor so I could still drive it on the street, but it still makes 256 on the motor, but we took up the NOS system and Doug wow. made a bunch of one-off parts. And Gary did an amazing job of my 48s so over 52s really. But, uh, um, and the car ended up being really nice. It's painted uh, guards red, same as one of my Porsches and, and um, really fun to drive, and and it's a DKK car it was, and um, and I love driving it, and it ran hard, it ran good, but um, you know moving to Arizona, and I'm five hours away, and I just didn't really drive it. I just didn't think it was right, so I ended up selling it to a guy who really wanted to get back into it. And he really wanted a big motor car, and I go, well, I don't think you're going to find a car bigger than this. Uh, and it had short, short trans in it. And it's just like, uh, not great, not a great freeway flyer, but boy, it really went on the street. Yeah. Monster on the street. No, it's, yeah. and that's kind of the thing, right? I mean, there's, there's, you know, I, I, one of the pictures you sent me, I, I can tell you're at Spring Mountain Motorsports track here in, uh, out yeah. in Pahrump. And exactly. I, I had a 996 that I, I used to take out there and track. And, uh, they're just, you know, it, it's a different kind of racing. And I tell people all the time, like drag racing's fun. But if you've ever been on a track at speed in any car, like pushing that car, that's a different, yeah. that's a different kind of fun because, you know, drag racing, you're going to be, it's going to be real intense for anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds. Right. But when you're on a track yeah. and you're on that track for 30 minutes, <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a different kind of, because it's almost like a personal best thing. You know, you keep pushing yourself yeah. to try to, I want to hit the next corner by the time. You know, I got to hit 110 on the back straight. I got to hit 110. You know, just like chasing these things. But it's it's interesting because we drive these cars in the street. You know, like uh, the Porsches and stuff like that. And you've never driven them close to their capabilities. Correct. And and, and when you can take these cars on a track and make an attempt to drive that, you can't yeah. even you can't even push. You don't even have enough enough courage to push the car to what it can handle. Well, I. I being a Volkswagen guy and a, and a, and a German car guy, I loved Porsches my whole life as well. And I, I, I bought a nine, nine, three, uh -huh. a 96 twin turbo, the last of the hand built Porsches. It was beautiful. And, um, I started to, uh, at the bottom, I started, uh, doing like autocross mm -hmm. and doing that with the car. And that was fun. And then I bought, and then I said, well, you know what? I'm not going to tear up this car. It's too, too valuable. And it was going up in value way more than I paid for it. So I'm like, okay, so I bought a 2004 GT3. I drove it around for a while and I said, you know, I'm going to turn it into a full track car. So I got into it and uh, started going to race school. I kept going and kept going and I ended up getting my race license and started racing Porsches. And so I, I turned it into a full on track car with a, with a four liter and close trans and, and you know, <laughs> with the fire system. And I mean, it was a lot. I had to have a crew go with me. It was a lot. Yeah. Uh, you run through two sets of tires a weekend and, and, and it's hard on the body and all. And I said, well, I'm going to do it till I'm about 60. And after that, I just 
it was so hard on me. I said, it's like, okay, I got to quit doing that. Well, I remember driving home from a track day that I went to in my 996. And as I'm driving home, I get home that night. All of a sudden, my ribs are like, man, why do my ribs hurt? <laughs> and yeah. then I'm remembering, oh, yeah. like, from the bolsters in the seats just holding me in from railing the cars through the turns. It's like it was, it was, it was, uh, an interesting uh, discovery to find out that, you know, 30 minutes per clip on the track yeah. at a time is going to make your ribs hurt a little bit from. I want to beat you up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, uh, I, I'm doing like 156 on the straightaway at Willow Springs. You come in and you're turn and you're three wide. And yeah. you're like, this car's going to stick, isn't it? Because <laughs> yeah. if it does, you're going off. Yeah. But, uh, I raced for up there and uh, by you guys and, and um, got my license there actually. Um, you know, but now um, I still love cars. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been driving a Ford pickup truck my whole life. I still drive that. Mm -hmm. I have an incredible Tesla Model S P100D that's actually quicker than any car I've ever had. It's ungodly how fast they are. And then, you know, my wife drives the AMG, and it's pretty quick too. And then and then from time to time, I don't get it out very often, but I have an ultra rare 12 cylinder Ferrari that I drive. And and when you get in that, it actually smells Italian. It smells different than a German car. Yeah. Well, but uh, I'm just enjoying my life now here with my grandkids, golfing and shooting and going to car shows and things like that. Yeah, no. I mean, you know, and it's one of those things where, you know, we all go through these different different seasons in our lives where we have these these things that we think, you know, there's they're something for us personally. But so much of this hobby is like, you build and create something, whether it's through your your work, your talent, or your money that you've earned through your work and your talent, and you come up with this creation that's your idea, and you get it out there, and the interesting aspect is that it inspires other people to do things, which is really cool, because every Volkswagen is essentially a blank canvas for somebody to do whatever they will with, and yeah. when you build something that inspires so many people, or you get lucky enough to build something that your crazy idea turns into like, a benchmark car of a vehicle that everybody remembers, you know, which is yeah. really cool because in a, in a world of 40 million Volkswagens to have a few that can stand out at the top of your mind and say, what about this one? What about that one? What about this one? You know, there's, there's few cars that can enter that echelon and, you know, luckily through the, through the podcast, I'm able to, you know, kind of do like we did here and just do a little deep dive and get some info on it and some background and, who you are and what motivated you to build it and you know, all that stuff. So as far as Volkswagen, you still have your 67 today, your stalker, huh? Oh yeah. I'm never going to sell it. And that's the, yeah. that's the go-to no matter what we need that smell of Volkswagen horse hair interior. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. you, you well, you know, it, it's been quite a blessing. It's been a long journey for me. Um, thinking back when I was just, you know, six, seven, eight years old, really started liking Volkswagens. And here I am almost 67 and I'm still doing it. So, yeah, no, it's, it, listen, it's a great hobby. And you know, it's, it's, there, there's so many, so many lateral plays off of it, different people that we meet throughout the hobby, which is what, which is really what the podcast is about. It's about the people behind the hobby that make this hobby that we all get into that everybody that's not into Volkswagens looks at us and goes, what are these guys so obsessed with this dumb car for, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, I, I say this a million times. The podcast, it's it's genuinely the people's car, and it's like it really is. It is yeah. the, the great Saying equalizer. I really appreciate everything you're doing. Um, I'm glad to be part of it, and um, you know, in the end, it's just it's all about the people. I've met so many great people. I've been really blessed, and and uh, and and I consider them all friends. Well, Randy, I appreciate you taking some time and coming on the podcast. I'm glad we got to sit down and, and chat about it, and. Next time I'm in Arizona, I'll look you up and uh, we'll, uh, we'll 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 chat about Volkswagens. Maybe I'll see you at a show down there sooner or later. Sounds great. Hey, I appreciate your time. All right, take care. Thanks. Bye. Well, if you like that podcast, and I'm sure you did, go to Apple Podcasts. Give us a five star review. Type out a written review. Don't forget to include your name so you can get a shout out on the podcast. Also, if you want a shout out on the podcast, go to Let's Talk Dubs.com. Go to Let's Talk Dubs.com. Click on the store, pick up some merch, support your boy in his podcast, buy a cool sweatshirt today at letstalkdubs.com. So until next week, later. Let's talk dubs.
probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. 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 Volksw